Yes, this will be a, a challenge on the coordination with the slides. So thank you. And so yesterday we mentioned about the, some of the major features in a scheduling system. So we know the registration, the um, patient information, scheduling, as well as the communication are the key parts. And then the advanced integration features that I mentioned about like the patient visit management, workflow management providers, and billings. Reports and business intelligence is extremely important because it gives you really an overall performance of what is going on in your entire system. So it could include a lot of things inside. And then billings itself, although we may not care so much about the finance part, but knowing the billings means that you know exactly where all these veterans are being sent to different sites. And so it gives you an overview of the care coordination and every, every visit that they have gone to. So that's also important. And I love that there's a huge mentioning about telehealth. I think absolutely, and this is really a way to go. And so now I am trying to look at like the limitations itself, and it fits really perfectly to all the um, panels that talk about yesterday, right? The data security, how do we capture all the data? How do you really schedule it so that it's multi-stage and that you have care coordination? It's the end-to-end. -end. That's the most important part, it's end-to-end -end process itself, not just individual points. And how do you truly utilize technology and optimization and machine learning to really help you to build good models within different parts of the system where it is truly integrated? And I love that we have to define all the English. So like, what does what does integration mean? So I'm really happy. Now the next picture is I'm going to show. So last night I tried to squeeze all of these into a single figure and uh, I know I failed miserably, but I think at least I tried. So here we have the end users, right? That's the patients, the physicians, and the staff. So understanding everybody is going to integrate with it. And, uh, and then of course, you know, the care coordinator, or we call them scheduling agents, they are really, really, really important, right? Because this is the frontline worker that basically talk to the patient. And if this person has really good relationship with your patient, your patient is going to show up up more often and you, you won't miss them in schedule. So this is really the relationship that we cannot miss. And then in the next phase is, these are the, I apologize, it is not very big here. So the red ones are the basic features. So if you look at this, the red one that I put down, the pre-registration, scheduling, and also the, um, the patient information. And I put the little little EMR thing in it. So basically that is really all the basic features. But I pull out the communication and coordination out. And I think the VA uh, panel is really was excellent to show how coordination, how is it carried out, is it so complicated. So I think it deserves to have a wedge of itself. So now if you look at these wedges as phases of the integration, then you can see really like lots of advanced features uh, around it, and as you implement it, you can implement it by pulling out each of these wedges, or in each of these wedges, you have layers of faces, right, that you in, in, in implement that. So then, I think this gives us like, what are the dream features that we want? Of course, there's so many of them. And then now, how is it being powered? And the like, next one is that this will be powered by the really the technology, right? The mathematical programming and modeling, discrete event simulation, statistical analysis, machine learning, and distributed computing, because all the data now is distributed across, right? Your data is not just in one single center, but it is in many different places and for redundancy as well as really for safety and security. So I think that's really um, what I'm thinking, trying to squeeze all these little words into, like all the other words into a, a picture and gives you um, some idea. And then I think Rachel gave me the green light yesterday that I could talk about integer programming. I think Chris actually <laughs> actually said that. I, I was so happy when I heard him say about integer programming. I said, this is great. And then there's decision tree. I will also talk about that. So in the next slide, and I'm going to talk about, now it's really tiny. It's, it's not like, um, this is like, look at it like just the art, okay? So this is the machine learning framework that Dr. Hu mentioned. It's the uh, DMIP, is, is the uh, discriminant analysis via mixed integer programming. Basically, this is a system where you can classify patients into many different ways. 
you can say looking at complexity. So based on what type of data you have. So it is operational as well as really clinical. Operational means you can predict the type of resource that is needed for different type of patients based on complexity of their needs. And, and the complexity itself doesn't have to be just disease oriented. It could also be resource of the sites and the type of resources and the type of like even home care and, and all of these is being captured. And basically you see the group is, is separated. And here the group correspond to different level of patient's need and different type of characteristics. So if you use these to attack the priority queues, and, and so as Mike yesterday asked the first question, and I think Mark was smart and he, he, he didn't I have to answer you, but he would be very passionate to answer you. So we are a little bit like, next generation. And Mark spends so much time and so many years figure out what is the perfect queue, and then we just throw it into the computer and say, now tell me exactly where they belong to. Right? So that's, that's some of the advantages we have, and it works beautifully. You can really separate them very nicely. And the nice things about this model is that it gives you the ability to say, hey, some patients may not belong to any queue at the beginning because they have like special needs. And so you can classify all of th some of these, but some of them we call them like reserve judgment. And basically say these individuals may need special care. You may have to walk through them and you assign them to special coordinator. And I think that is really nice because we basically say, well, we don't all have to be exactly the same, even though we may have the same disease or we need to, to see the same doctor. So it gives you some, some of these uh, capability. And if you look at these, applying that to the neurology um, scheduling, and very interesting because the doctors actually are very passionate about. So if you look at it, it really takes them two months to figure out how do you schedule this particular patient because every one of them is so different. And with a system like this, it would take them only 48 hours. And I think uh, it is really rather important for these patients, especially if you have problem, just maybe a little dementia and you wonder, oh, do I have Alzheimer's or am I getting really like forgetful and and so patients get really really nervous and the longer they wait and the worse it gets so I think this is pretty important and it improves the providers work performance and it also eliminates the waste time and it maximizes the clinic throughput now no clinic is going to say they're trying to make money but truly being able to provide a service for patients is extraordinarily important. For every time that they save, that means they can see another patient, and I think that's very important. And reduce the uh, backlog, and also increase the really the ease of information flow. As you see now, you have the information across different providers, and they can coordinate. And even the nurse, even the staff knows exactly what's going on about this patient, and I think that's really nice. And also really um, very objective in terms of categorizing the patient. And one of the reasons why you don't want a scheduler to put patients in different queues is precisely that. It is extraordinarily difficult for schedulers to throw them everything, say, okay, look, now you schedule all the patients according to different queues. But what it means is that you make their problems bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And I know one of the, one of the things that we learned in the first class of decision uh, science is that ordinary people can make decisions if there are seven variables. But then if you ask any Desiree or Mia, you ask them what, how many variables they have when they have to make decisions, maybe thousands, or tens of thousands, or like, right? Hundreds of thousands for the doctors. So all of a sudden, it is not because you are so not good that you cannot make the best decision. It is simply that you are being told that you have to make all these decisions within such a short time that it is really questionable, right? It doesn't give you that capability that your, your decision is the most informed decision, and that's where the computer and the technology comes in. And so the successful implementation is, we have a lot of these implementation that um, I think the, the clinic workflow and resource allocation, the system has been implemented in the ED and it has remarkable results, really, really nice results. Not only the workflow increased by 30%, it reduced the um, percentage of uh, left without being seen. It increased the number of trauma patients uh, being able to be seen and also increase the time, like, or, or decrease the time where they, they get to see the, the doctor. So all of these are really measurable. So I think that is also important. You have to be able to measure your outcome. 
So you can use this system for early diagnosis. And if you input all the data, clinical data, genomic data, and everything, and you want to figure out where is this patient, like what is the predictive an analytics where it can tell you early disease diagnosis. Pre-diabetic patients, right? You can stop them from marching into diabetes. And we got some uh, very interesting results for uh, Alzheimer's. When I was being given data for Alzheimer's patients versus patients that do not have Alzheimer's. And so instead of classify two groups, I actually classify patients with three groups. And doctors say, well, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not doing it right, just two groups. I said, I don't know. I said, These, there's a group of patients that we don't know where they belong. They are not Alzheimer's. They're not like normal, like control group. And then as it turns out, those patients actually show early sign of um, um, mild cognitive impairment. And the doctor immediately said, okay, there's, we are going to treat this patient. So I think there's opportunity for you even to improve your quality of care. And I think that's very exciting. And decision trees, I think that's uh, Mayo uh, talk about that. And I think uh, Lisa asked about the decision tree. I, I don't know if you could see this one. This is actually a decision tree that we designed for the uh, surgical site infection reduction. And uh, the first little one is the green notes are the, um, the decision notes and the red circle is the chance note. So that means at that point, what is the chance that you're doing different things and then, and then success and all these uh, split. And so basically for this one, we want to know exactly what are the key points that out of these hundreds of different steps, we understand if we are gonna make changes, you cannot change everything because if you try to change things, you may introduce new errors. So we try to figure out out of these complex system, what are the critical nooks that you can change so that you get the best return. <coughs> on investment. In this case, reduce the surgical infection. So when we actually optimize this, and then there's all these optimal paths. So not only we do decision tree, we also optimize it. And then you can see the, the last one, and very tiny. This is an optimal path of what to do. And it is hilarious for my students because we have no idea what surgical, like, you know, nothing about operations, don't know anything, even shaving, I mean, even clipping of the hair took us one whole month to figure out exactly what that means because, you know, we are not doctors. So, and, and, um, and, and also, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, but nonetheless, we discover a lot of the things that the doctors um, was really quite surprised because they said, oh my gosh, you, see, you guys discovered this, we didn't know. And, and I said, well, you know, we actually really don't know any of these things, right? You just, we just build the whole thing and then put it into the computer and say, okay, which step is most critical? And then it pops that out. And you know what results we get? That's the most important one. We reduce the surgical site infection from 23% to 8% within eight months. From the first day when we step into the hospital where everybody rejected us, thinking we are the inspector, <laughs> <laughs> and and to the to the after six months they all ask us to talk to them and, and embrace us, say, Yes, we all work for the patient. I, say, I love that, right? And and then at the end, after six more months, it is zero and it's sustained all the way. I mean that's really what you like to see, right? And I think we are very fortunate because every single one of these we work closely with the doctors. And as I say, we are so crazily ignorant about the medical terms, but nonetheless, they accepted us. So I think we are very fortunate. And then the second one is the uh, central line uh, associated blood um, stream infection. We reduced 20% of them. And not only that, we identified for those patients that contracted clamsy, what are, the, what are these individuals that may actually die as a result? We identify those and being able to really uh, I, like do the early intervention. And then there's the uh, bone marrow. Now finally we get to scheduling. So this is also quite exciting and I have to say the doctors, uh, I give them all the credit. So the idea is that these patients before they have chemotherapy and uh, or radiation, they got the um, the uh, stem cells collected. And so patients come in, you have to uh, schedule them. Uh, and how many cells are you going to collect? And are you going to be successful in the first visit and everything? So the challenge here is that the nurses have to work overtime on Saturday to collect cells because sometimes patients, the first try, didn't get any, any cells. And, and so there's a lot of, um, not no show, they always show, but just that 
no cells were collected, unfortunately. So our challenge is really to improve the patient um, experience. And of course, scheduling is the big, 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 big deal part of that. So that this is really uh, everything about scheduling. And also really to improve the morale of the workers. I mean, a lot of times we say, I think patients are happy, but I also want the providers to be happy because I think that's really important. If they are both happy, then we are happy too. So that's the result here in the next one is that we were able to improve the utilization from 56% to 92%. We eliminate the Saturday uh, overtime and, and truly improve the 30% of the throughput. So here's the result, this graph. And the blue is the original one. It actually was amazing because we gave them the result and a doctor looked at it and he said, we're going to start that. So I presented the result to them in May and that's after we look at it for six months. And I said, this is preliminary result. We want to work on it a little bit longer. And the doctor said, okay, we're going to start the, your, your schedule in July. I almost freaked out. I said, okay, I said, are we ready? <laughs> are we ready yet? Right? We want to be perfect. And I said, no, no, we are going to use it. And so as it turns out, oops. It, it really works very well, as you can see, right? I mean, the orange one is the performance, you can see. Now you ask me how come Wednesday, some of the day is over 100% utilization. That really means that the patient started the stem cells collection and it kind of like, you know, like went over to uh, 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. So, but I think the results is really good and, and they actually use this for the new bone marrow center. So I think it was really wonderful. And then the last one, this is a really complicated one. It's another scheduling. And um, so we have to look at the patterns of the, on the um, left side of this, on, on the left side, yes, this side, is, is the regular elective um, operations. And the other side is the uh, emergency uh, operations. So, you know, in the OR, when you schedule things, it's not like you could just say, oh, this is my slot and, and don't touch it. Because if there's a patient that truly life and death, they have to be squeezed in, they will get priority. So we look at the pattern of the time. And then we look at uh, decision tree classification to figure out what are the factors influencing. And then we look at the outpatient, inpatient, and the also the the uh, patient that are emerging uh, like uh, OR patient and see how long it takes them for a different type of operations. Remember, there's a shared resources, right, the OR. And then we do a lot of analysis. So what I really tell you is that the data analysis part is extraordinarily important if you want to really automate it. And then the next one is the scheduling. So since I was given the chance to show all the integer program and, and Surely, this powered the system. So we actually optimized it. Basically, you can put that into exactly your scheduling in any form, primary care, specialty, and everything. And then when you solve it, the improvement is, is really nice. And these are real results. And utilization improved from 56% to 93%. The on-time OR, and you know on-time is so important, but then when we first look at it, we, we couldn't quite understand 34%. So, okay, that's nothing, right? It's not on time. Don't even say about that term or else it will be kind of embarrassing. But now, like, they really are able to achieve it. They were able to really achieve it in a sense that with a lot of pride because they understand that they have a lot of support in the back end. And then, of course, the delay in terms of the uh, getting into the hospital and being able to do the operations is extremely important. So these are some of the successes, and I think it really is a collaboration, and I would say that the doctors and the coordinators, they all, like basically entire clinical team, contribute to all these successes in terms of implementation and also being able to measure the outcome. Thank you.